Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on uh, COVID-19 and smoking, latest updates from the CDC and the front lines. Uh, as a quick housekeeping note, uh, throughout the webinar, please make sure to submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer those during the panel discussion at the end. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome the president-elect of the American Osteopathic Association, Dr. Thomas Ely. Dr. Ely. Thank you for joining us. I've talked to many of you in the last few recent weeks, and what I'm hearing is how dedicated our osteopathic family has been, not only in addressing our current pandemic issues, but how you are supporting your patients' chronic medical and current social conditions. Thank you for all that you do. And welcome to the webinar, COVID-19 and Smoking, latest updates from the CDC and the front lines offered in partnership with the Centers for Disease Control's tips from former smokers campaign. The AOA is thrilled to partner with the CDC on this campaign to share resources that will be useful to our physicians and their teams as you encourage smoking cessation and support your patient's efforts to discontinue smoking. And as physicians, we all know that tobacco abuse remains a leading preventable cause of death and disease in the United States. Cigarette smoking alone is killing more than 480,000 Americans each year, and yet 34 million Americans still smoke. And coupling smoking with our COVID-19 pandemic is truly a recipe for disaster. What I like about the CDC's TIP campaign is that it profiles real people who are living with serious long-term health effects from smoking and secondhand smoke exposure. The campaign also features family members who are impacted by their loved ones smoking-related illnesses. We are fortunate today to hear presentations from Dr. Brian King, and Dr. Richard Bryce. Dr. King is the Deputy Director for Research Translation for the Office on Smoking and Health in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He will provide the latest evidence of the impact of COVID-19 on current and former smokers. Dr. King has worked for nearly 15 years to provide scientific evidence to support tobacco control policy and to effectively communicate this information to key stakeholders. He has authored or co-authored nearly 150 peer-reviewed scientific articles pertaining to tobacco prevention and control. He was a contributing author to the 50th anniversary Surgeon General's report on smoking and health, and was the lead author of the CDC's 2014 update to the guide, Best Practices for Comprehensive Tobacco Control Programs, and was the senior associate editor of the 2016 Surgeon General's report, E-Cigarette Use Among Youth and Young Adults. Following Dr. King's presentation, Dr. Richard Bryce will discuss how best to initiate cessation conversations with patients in our current environment. Dr. Bryce is an osteopathic family physician who practices and serves as chief medical officer at the Community Health and Social Services Center, a federally qualified health center in Detroit, Michigan. He is also clinical faculty faculty at the Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, Wayne State University School of Medicine, and Henry Ford Health System. Dr. Bryce also partnered with the AOA and CDC in the TIPS campaign from, for, from Smokers in 2019, and I want to thank him for his important contribution to this program. And there will be a discussion following Dr. King's and Dr. Bryce's presentations, where they will be joined by Dr. Evelyn Twentyman, 
a medical epidemiologist and board certified internist, currently leading global research evaluation and translation in the CDC's office, CDC's office on smoking and health global tobacco control branch. And in the current CDC response to COVID-19, Dr. Twentyman has served as the lead of the medical conditions unit within the Community Intervention and At-Risk Task Force. And before I turn things over to Dr. King and Dr. Bryce, I want to highlight the AOA's collaboration with the CDC and emphasize the important role that you as physicians play in helping patients stop their tobacco use. The AOA is looking for physician partners like you who are interested in using the TIPS campaign materials in your practice, tracking smoking cessation conversations with your patients, and helping the AOA and CDC better understand current smoking cessation efforts by healthcare teams. So I would like to encourage you to partner with us on this effort and share your information with us. Information on how to participate is on the registration page of this webinar and more information about the TIPS campaign and resources can be found at the campaign website, which will be shared with you at the end of the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. King and Dr. Bryce. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks uh, everyone uh, for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Um, I'm Brian King uh, with the CDC. Um, I'll be speaking uh, to you today from two different hats. Uh, my my uh, traditional hat and CDC's Office of Smoking and Health, but I'm also the Deputy Chief Science Officer um, for the agency's COVID-19 response. Um, and, and I appreciate AOA's invitation uh, to speak to you today on a, on a very important topic, um, which is smoking cessation. And we've had a lot of momentum on this issue within the past uh, a year um, over the release of the Surgeon General's report on smoking cessation, but you know, lest we forget that the, despite the, the ongoing pandemic, um, smoking remains the leading cause of preventive disease and death in this country. And so uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, useful information in the context of COVID-19 and smoking, um, but uh, the bottom line when it comes to smoking cessation is we know what works, and we have to effectively continue um, to, to ensure that that gets into the hands of, of people that are, are most uh, poised to benefit from it. Um, and so with that, I'll get started on, on my slides for today. I'll note that I have um, uh, no uh, disclosures um, aside from the fact that I am um, a, a federal employee with the U.S. government. So depending on who you ask, that may or may not be a conflict of interest, um, but otherwise um, I have no uh, conflicts of, of interest to report. Um, so, uh, in terms of, of some background information, um, uh, some of this uh, may be preaching to the choir, but just so we're all aware in terms of the current CDC messaging um, and, and COVID-19, we know this is a large family of viruses um, that cause respiratory illness. There's seven different coronaviruses um, that were first isolated back in the 1960s, and they're named for that crown-like spikes on the surface. Uh, there's four subgroupings, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Some can spread between animals and people, um, uh, and thus are zoonotic. Um, the uh, coronaviruses that have gotten the most attention um, in the past several years would be SARS, um, as well as uh, MERS. Uh, and there's a lot of, of lessons learned in terms of science that we've been using um, to inform our, our evidence-based practice messaging at CDC, and that includes the issue of smoking um, in terms of a potential uh, risk factor and how it impacts um, COVID-19. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the current state of the science on, on where did COVID-19 come from, um, we do know that it was identified in Wuhan, China in December 2019. Um, it, it's caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2, uh, um, and early on, many of the patients reported to have a link to a large seafood and live animal market. Um, later, patients did not have that exposure. And so what does that tell us? That tells us it indicates person-to-person -person, um, a community spread, um, which is terminology that you've heard in the United States over the past uh, several months. In terms of travel-related exportation of cases reported in the United States, the first U.S. case was, was January 21, um, 2020. Um, and in terms of the latest information on CDC reporting of, of confirmed um, COVID-19 cases in the U.S., um, there is the link, uh, which you can also go to cdc.gov um, slash COVID-19 um, uh, for the, the latest information, including uh, recommendations. 
In terms of the, the symptoms and complications of COVID-19, um, we do know that symptoms may include fever, cough, uh, shortness of breath. Um, there's a wide range of illness severity um, that has been reported um, from mild to severe. In terms of incubation period, um, as I'm heard, uh, sure you've already heard, two to 14 days, um, and, and complications may include a variety of things, including pneumonia, respiratory failure, as well as multi-system uh, organ failure. Um, in terms of how to prevent um, uh, COVID-19, though, um, we, we know what works. We have the available science to inform that, and, and many of these um, interventions um, and evidence-based interventions have been used uh, to inform the American public, including simple things that we all know around cleaning your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or with hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Also avoiding close contact with people who are sick. Um, this has uh, uh, been the, the uh, primary crux behind the stay at home um, orders and uh, people distancing uh, six feet between yourself and others, um, and also uh, covering your mouth and nose with a cloth face uh, covering when uh, around others, um, and to cover coughs and sneezes. Again, this has reinforced a lot of those public health messaging you've seen coming out of CDC as part of a comprehensive approach, including um, the community face coverings. And then, of course, cleaning and disinfecting frequently um, uh, touch surfaces daily. So in terms of who's at higher risk for severe illness, the science is continuing to emerge. We're looking at a variety of different things to help inform that at CDC. As I noted before, it's uh, a lot of the information that's existing in the literature. For, for, so for smoking, that's the Surgeon General's reports, right? We've released um, over 33 of those over the past half century. So we've got a lot of science showing us around uh, different risk factors uh, for smoking, including immunosuppression. Um, but we're also looking at the experience with SARS and MERS and the emerging data internationally and also the growing body domestically in the U.S. around potential risk factors. And so you can see older adults as well as people with underlying medical conditions are primarily at higher risk for severe disease. Um, and that includes those listed here. Um, and in terms of the current messaging from CDC on smoking, we couch that uh, within uh, people who are immunocompromised in terms of having higher risk um, for severe illness. So in terms of what role CDC plays, I'm sure there's a lot of folks wondering, what is CDC doing? And I assure you that we're doing um, what CDC does best and has done best um, for, for many um, years, um, regardless of the outbreak investigation. And that's um, the science, identify community impacts and who is at higher risk, monitoring and evaluation, um, technical assistance to the states, also importantly, communication, developing materials. Um, the latest information from CDC is readily put out on our website, cdc.gov slash COVID-19, as well as on social media. Um, it's best to refer to those sources in terms of the, the most um, accurate science-based information to inform our public health policy and practice as well as clinical practice and also partnerships including sharing findings and that's what we're doing here today um, we appreciate the long-standing collaboration with AOA and we're, we're uh, glad we have the opportunity to connect with a critical um, uh, uh, bolus of folks who are on the ground um, uh, addressing this issue um, on a daily basis um, so in terms of uh, the smoking issue, I'll now transcend into where we are on the science. Um, as I've noted before, uh, tobacco control has the luxury of over a half century of science showing us what works. Not all risk factors uh, have that luxury. And so since the first Surgeon General's report in 1964, there's been a large body of science um, that has shown us not only um, what increases the risk of smoking, makes people more susceptible, but also importantly, what interventions are most critical um, to not only help people quit, but also to prevent them um, from starting in the first place. And so over time, we've seen a variety of different adverse health effects that have been causally associated with smoking um, uh, in the, the scientific literature. And this is the most recent summarized from the 50th anniversary report in 2015. And the red ones are the ones um, uh, that were newly added in 2014. And that doesn't mean that they weren't always associated with smoking. It was just that we had enough science to inform it. Again, CDC is a data-driven scientific agency. We use the science to inform public health practice. And the same goes with smoking. And so you can see there's a lot of things on this list that you wouldn't necessarily consider to be associated with smoking, things like diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis. But an important component that's relevant to the COVID-19 discussion is the immune function. Um, and in the 2014 report, we included for the first time three very important conclusions around linking smoking and immunosuppression that were essential to informing CDC's recommendations 
smoking being a risk factor early on before we necessarily had data around the link between smoking and COVID-19 from epidemiologic studies, but we had an existing bolus of science um, to reinforce the risk uh, given the role of uh, smoking and immunosuppression. And uh, the most important is really at the bottom here that the evidence is sufficient to infer that cigarette smoking compromised the immune system and that altered immunity is associated with increased risk of pulmonary infections. And so this really sets the stage for the available science um, that we know in terms of coronaviruses more broadly, but also in the context of COVID-19. Um, so where are we in terms of the, the current state of affairs um, with evidence linking smoking and respiratory? Well, we know that smoking um, and, and respiratory illnesses, um, there's a strong link. A person who smokes is a greater risk of developing and a harder time recovering from respiratory illnesses. Smoking is also associated with increased development of acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, syndrome in people with risk factors such as severe infection, non-pulmonary sepsis, and blunt trauma. Um, but when it comes to smoking and coronaviruses, what do we know from the existing literature? But we do know that co-occurring conditions, including things like COB, cardio, COPD, cardiovascular and other respiratory diseases have been found to worsen prognosis in patients with other coronaviruses, particularly SARS and MERS. Um, and we also know that smoking is related to higher expression of, of ACE2. Uh, and so that's what you see on this diagram over here. Um, in terms of uh, ACE2 is the primary receptor uh, that the virus that causes COVID-19 binds to. And so if you have higher expression for that, then there's higher likelihood of, of, of various adverse effects associated um, with uh, infection with, with COVID-19. Um, so that being said, there's a broad body of science that has really set the stage um, for the ongoing um, efforts specifically related to COVID-19. That being said, we're starting to get to the point where we're starting to get specific science um, assessing this link between smoking and COVID-19. Some studies out of China uh, showed that a history of smoking was associated with uh, a disease progression uh, among patients. We also know that ACE2 expression was significantly higher in Asian smokers than non-smokers. And there was also another study that found a non-significant trend towards an association observed between smoking and COVID-19 severity. Of note, CDC is collecting data from a variety of sources, including epidemiologic data from case reports that come from the states, and then also um, clinical data um, through uh, uh, COVID-NET, which co collects information from electronic health records in 14 states um, to help inform um, our messaging. But it's important to note now, right now, a lot of the states and clinicians have been focused on treatment, right? So there hasn't been this deluge of data necessarily to CDC. So a lot of our existing data systems don't yet have enough uh, data to help inform a robust scientific analysis, which is why we've been very careful in some of our preliminary studies that we've released in terms of the estimates of smoking, is we're seeing markedly lower rates of smoking just because we don't necessarily have the data reported yet. But now we're getting to the point where data is starting to come in from states and we should have a better picture of what the exact epidemiologic association is um, between smoking um, and COVID-19 based on the US experience. But uh, regardless, we do have data from other uh, sources that has helped um, to, to inform those efforts. Um, so uh, another important factor here, and there's a lot of discussion in the media around how does smoking influence COVID-19 susceptibility and severity, and it's important to note that these are two different things. So risk of infection and risk of more severe disease are two very different things, and a lot of times there's getting conflated in the dialogue, and right now the data is very um, distinct between the two. There's certainly far more science um, demonstrating increased risk of, of COVID-19 um, in terms of, of disease severity, and that a smoke Smoking increases um, the risk of more severe disease, but there's not as much robust science as on incident infection um, with the virus that causes COVID-19. And so you'll see there's very clear messaging from CDC in terms of disease severity, um, but we still continue to monitor the available science on incident infection. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of studies that have uh, been published on the disease severity front. Um, there was just a recent uh, scientific review that was a meta-analysis um, that was published in Nicotine and Tobacco Research that found about 30 percent of COVID-19 patients with a history of smoking experienced disease progression um, and that smoking was increased with about a two-fold increased risk in terms of more severe disease or disease progression. So there's the science is certainly leaning towards this area as you can see by the, the graphic on that uh, study that was published. Um, but again we continue to monitor the available science and there are some studies that are coming out suggesting a protective effect of smoking. And so why is that the case? Well there's a variety of things happening. Certainly there's some epidemiologic considerations. A lot of these studies, including a recent French study that found a protective effect 
um, had very diminished samples. They had um, some misclassification of smokers that could lead to driving the effect towards the null or even a protective effect. And also some issues with the sample in terms of them primarily um, interviewing healthcare providers, but we know have slower smoking rates to begin with. So there's still a lot of discussion around potential up and down regulation of nicotine and its impact in terms of ACE2. Um, but right now we have a strong and growing body of science showing more disease severity and we continue to monitor the evidence that around infection. Um, but the bottom line is that irrespective of COVID-19, now is never a better time than ever uh, to, to quit smoking, which we know the smoking harms nearly every organ of the body. And when a cigarette is used as directed by the manufacturer, kills half its users. And so now is a better time than ever to really um, uh, uh, help promote cessation um, of, of conventional cigarettes. We also know there's a, a lot of talk about e-cigarettes, the topic du jour. Um, we've got uh, close to one third of, of US youth are using these products, about 3% of US adults using these products. Um, equates to about 13 million Americans, a lot of concerns over the effects of these devices. They've evolved over time. Um, we do know that they do not emit a harmless water vapor. We know that it's harmful in terms of, of what's in uh, the, the actual um, devices themselves. So definitely you should not be using these products. Um, and the uh, potential effect of cessation is still unknown. Uh, based on the recent Surgeon General's report. Um, but we do know from a growing body of science that there could be potential damage um, to the lungs from use of these devices, but we don't nearly have as much science as we do for conventional cigarettes um, in terms of, of lung damage or um, uh, for uh, immunosuppression. And so we also know that there was a recent outbreak of e-cigarette vaping product use associated lung injury um, this past year, um, which was primarily linked to THC-containing products uh, obtained from informal sources and specifically linked to vitamin E acetate. Um, so regardless of the, the existing science on e-cigarettes um, and, and the link with immunosuppression, we do know that people who already have existing lung injury would be more susceptible uh, to, to contraction of, of pulmonary infection, and that includes the virus that causes COVID-19. But in terms of e-cigarettes in general, um, we, we don't yet have sufficient science to go either way in terms of the effect of e-cigarette use on uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, disease progression or um, uh, infection. Um, so here's the, the key takeaways in terms of where the science sits on this issue. Um, the bottom line from CDC right now is we know that cigarette smoking um, can suppress the immune system and cause heart and lung disease. So that's where our messaging has been focused in terms of at-risk populations. And based on the science, we know a person who smokes may have a harder time recovering from COVID-19. So the science is there on disease progression. In terms of incident infection, it's something that we continue to investigate. There's only a handful of studies, and the ones that have been uh, conducted have uh, very uh, uh, robust limitations um, that, that prevent us from making any uh, strong conclusions. Um, and although there is some dialogue of, uh, about a potential protective effect of smoking, the science just is not there to support that, uh, particularly given a lot of the limitations. So it's something that we continue um, to, to assess, but in the near term, we know um, that, that quitting smoking is very beneficial and beneficial at any age. In terms of e-cigarettes, the relationship between the use of e-cigarettes risk of COVID-19 is uncertain. We don't have science to show either way. Um, and uh, when it comes to uh, public health messaging and clinical message uh, for help putting tobacco use or staying tobacco free, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW, visit smokefree.gov, continue to promote the five A's and other um, uh, clinical efforts to help people quit. Regardless of COVID-19, quitting is beneficial at any age, and now is a better time uh, than ever uh, to do that. Um, in terms of resources for folks, um, we're on uh, all of social media, um, including uh, Pinterest, so we recently added. So if that doesn't get you excited, I'm not sure what will. Um, but there's also a lot of resources around uh, quitting smoking in terms of cdc.gov slash quit, um, some federal resources, and also importantly, CDC resources. We have a lot of a great team of folks um, working on the COVID-19 response. Several thousand CDC staff have been deployed um, over the past several months since early January um, to really develop these materials to inform um, uh, our, our messaging. So I'd really encourage you to go there for information on not only a clinical practice but also a broader public health messaging. Continue to update that website with information including on smoking related factors um, um, moving forward. So with that I'm, I'm happy to transition over to our next speaker um, and we'll be joined by my colleague Dr. Uh, Evelyn Twentyman who's going to help um, with question and answer um, uh, around um, the COVID-19 and smoking um, uh, relationship. Thanks folks.
Right, excellent. Well, I am uh, Richard Bryce. Um, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to participate in this uh, event. I uh, want to say thank you, Dr. Ely, for the uh, introduction in the beginning. Uh, I do appreciate your suit and tie. I apologize. I'm wearing uh, scrubs right now because once I finish here, I'll be doing uh, some testing in our drive up uh, COVID testing outside. So uh, thank you for that. Also, Dr. King, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, obviously, emphasizing epidemiology and physiology related to smoking and COVID is super, super important. I also am excited that the CDC uh, is on, on Pinterest now. I promise I will check that out once I uh, complete, I'm completed here. Um, the role for me today is obviously as a clinician to kind of give my experience. I have had the opportunity to, to work with the TIPS campaign through the CDC, which has been excellent, um, and also had a, the ability to experience uh, COVID-19 on the inpatient and outpatient side um, here in Detroit, Michigan. So. Um, I think you'll see there may be some overlap of Dr. King in terms of the epidemiology, uh, but I think that's only because this is a information that I've had to share with my patients, um, and I think it's important for us to uh, emphasize that to them. And so you may hear a couple things um, that I find uh, to be important as well. So let's uh, start. Let's see if I got this. Here we go, perfect. All right, so for myself as well, no disclosures uh, to share at this time. Um, I would also like to give you guys a little bit of my background. Um, as is stated, I'm in Detroit, Michigan right now. I am a uh, family physician uh, and uh, kind of wear a couple different hats. As was mentioned before, I'm the chief medical officer here at the Community Health and Social Services in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and so we are a uh, FQHC. Um, so predominantly take care of patients that are um, uh, uninsured or underinsured. Um, and we are in a very high uh, uh, population that has a lot of immigrants, specifically from Mexico and Central America. I apologize, this is uh, going a little bit too quick for me. Let me get back here. So that's uh, the, the CHAZ part, as was stated before. I'm also uh, work with the residency program at Henry Ford and have the ability to round at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit as well. Um, and so uh, I think understanding kind of the inpatient and outpatient side is really important for any clinician at this time. Um, and especially trying to connect that to encouraging those uh, that may smoke or have a, a history of smoking to quit. Um, and what I've seen on the inpatient side, especially is most of the patients, and some of you have probably seen this, just the rapid decompensation of patients um, that do get admitted to the hospital is incredible. Something I've never seen. Um, I, I mean, just stories of seeing patients that come to the hospital, um, they, they may get admitted from the emergency department into the general medical floor where I would work. They would be, uh, you know, on two liters of oxygen, saturating like 90, 92% on oxygen, um, and seem like they're doing fine. You just notice that they're a little bit tachypnic, and then within an hour, they may be at four liters of oxygen and then six liters. And the next thing you know, they may be intubated. And these are these were cases that we were seeing quite often. And Henry Ford, you know, Detroit got hit very hard, um, especially in the early phases, in the end of March to the beginning of April. Um, yesterday was the first day we haven't had any deaths in the city of Detroit um, in, in the last two months, which is really, really exciting, meaning that we're going in the right direction. But the severity of this illness was uh, very clear from the beginning, and especially understanding um, how quickly patients decompensate. What's interesting, a lot of the patients, even ones that didn't need to get intubated and just were on oxygen or getting sent home on oxygen, uh, we, I did have quite a few patients that I was taking care of that were smokers. And so um, understanding the tachypnea and the hypoxia and feeling that, I think convincing those people at that time to quit smoking uh, actually was not very difficult. Of course, who knows what has happened since then, but my, my suspicion is people felt the, the, the fear of not being able to breathe um, and that, and understanding, connecting that to smoking was uh, something that would allow them to want to quit. Now, on the flip side, um, that's one way of understanding it from the inpatient side. And I'm so sorry, these slides are going a little bit slow. Um, the, the, on the outpatient side, The outpatient side is a little bit different, right? So you have patients that, of course, are going to that I've seen that are COVID positive that are smoking. They seem somewhat motivated as well. But then you're also trying to convince those that may end up um, 
ending up uh, getting COVID-19 at some point um, that are smokers and using that as information to share with them to quit. Um, so I apologize, my slides seem to be stuck here right now. Let me see about, let me do this real quick. Let's, all right, well, at least we got one. Well, there's Chaz, that's where I'm at. That's we'll be outside in one second. Um, let's try to see if we can go to the next slide if anyone's helping me out there. There we go. All right, so as was already mentioned before uh, from Dr. King, uh, we know somewhat of the, the different coronaviruses um, in terms of uh, COVID-19 versus the SARS and the MERS as well, and that was pretty much emphasized very well. You know, one of the things I think is important for us to talk about with our patients, and I've had this conversation multiple times today, uh, with patients that have come back positive because we've had a wide variety of symptoms that patients have now that we're testing for many different types of people, people that are very, very sick to people that have mild symptoms. Um, and this is, I think, the connection as well to the smoking is the understanding that many people have um, uh, uh, this are not. So, of course, the severity of this ills, the, this disease in terms of mortality, it's kind of unclear because the new data is coming in. Um, but it may not be the most lethal um, uh, pandemic that we've had, um, but I think the combination of the mortality and morbidity associated along with the transmission from one person to the other uh, does make this uh, to be uh, more scary. And so in this case is that if you're a patient that may be sick and asymptomatic, but you live alongside somebody that is not um, you know, immunocompromised and maybe a smoker, um, this is why it's very important to understand that you have it and that you can transmit it and using that information to try to support those that may want to quit smoking or to improve their health in other ways. And this has been a conversation that I've had multiple times even today. All right, so moving on to the next slide here. Um, you know, some of the information that goes along with this, and this is, these are the things that I've shared with my patients, is that you know, there's a large amount of patients that are going to be asymptomatic uh, that do have, that do come back positive for COVID-19. And so this was from some research earlier um, on the Diamond Princess, um, where they screened all 3,700 patients. Um, and as you can see, there was 46.5% uh, uh, of those patients were asymptomatic at the time of testing, and that uh, there were 381 that became symptomatic, 37 required ICU care, and 1.3% died. And meaning that lots of people have this uh, and may not know that they have it, and that's the scary part of the, the R not in terms of the transmission. Next slide as well. Um, and so this is some of the, the a lot on this slide, um, but the main point it goes along with what Dr. King was mentioning in terms of these ACE2 receptors that we know may be upregulated in those that are smoking. This is where it appears that the virus connects, causes damage to those pneumocytes. So there's kind of the initial damage, um, which is going to cause uh, respiratory issues. Um, and then secondarily is the inflammatory uh, process that comes. And that's kind of where the acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS can come along um, and can cause a secondary inflammatory response that also causes issues with breathing. And of course, those are those patients that are uh, needing to be intubated at some point. All right, the next slide is welcoming. Um, and this kind of just emphasize once again where this is all occurring um, within the lungs. And I think this is, you know, deep into those alveoli, which we know are so sensitive to those that are smoking. And think of somebody that has emphysema um, and the loss of the ability to keep those alveoli open. I think being a smoker on top of having COVID-19 um, seems to be very, very detrimental. And, and I've definitely seen that firsthand. Next slide as well. Excellent. And so, you know, one of the things I think is important, because I've actually heard this from patients, similar to what Dr. King had mentioned, is that there have been some studies that say that maybe that there was a protective factor of being a smoker in terms of COVID-19. Now, that came from one study, and unfortunately, I've seen this actually posted on Facebook and social media. This was early on, March 12th. This was uh, what they had called, I believe, a, a meta-analysis on four studies at the time. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can see that there's been much more information that has come out um, that is uh, showing that, that smoking does not seem to be protective. In fact, it can be detrimental. And even Dr. King even had some more updated information, which was great. Uh, next slide as well, please. So for those of you that may not be familiar uh, with the TIPS program, um, and the TIPS, TIPS campaign come from the CDC, uh, we had an excellent opportunity over this past year to work along with the CDC and implement uh, some of the informational things for our patients. And so some of you may have seen the TV commercials because I know that they've been on uh, showing those that have had uh, 
you know, detrimental effects related to smoking. Uh, we have had, uh, you know, we were able to pl uh, place posters and have lots of uh, supplemental information for our patients, which I found, which was really incredible, because I knew that would be a way to communicate with our patients. But what I was so surprised is a lot of the patients actually wanted the posters to take home to share with other loved ones and their family. Um, and I think when you compare this idea of, hey, for us as osteopathic physicians and physicians in general, is how can we give the, the best opportunity for our patients to be healthy? Smoking needs to be one thing that we emphasize as well. And so now we have this secondary thing of COVID-19, which we know is going to affect the lungs and other areas of the body. Um, and the combination between smoking and uh, COVID-19 is not going to go well for our patients. And if that's our most important uh, uh, resource and, 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 and why we do what we do, I think this is an awesome opportunity to tie the two together, to use a program like TIPS to really encourage smoking cessation for our patients. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Excellent. So, um, and uh, we can go to the next slide. Here's the references as well. Um, and I think I just have one last thing at the end, of course, with that comes with uh, questions, but I just want to say thank you so much for allowing me to uh, speak with you guys right now and, and, and definitely looking forward to some questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. King. And we're looking forward to diving uh, into more detail into some of what you discussed. Um, any, if anyone has any questions, please uh, feel free to submit those in the Q&A box at this time and we'll take those as we go. Uh, but to kick things off, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Bryce, I'd love to start with you. And you framed uh, some of the important information that you feel is critical to share with patients. Um, uh, in this current moment in trying to encourage them to quit smoking. Um, one thing that I think is uh, worth highlighting is how uh, encounters are taking place differently now with so many patients uh, being seen via telemedicine. And uh, even as that uh, changes, I think patients will still be reluctant to come into the office for a short uh, time from now moving forward. Um, so how do you conduct conversations differently via telemedicine or are there best practices that you recommend for those conversations? Yeah, excellent question. Thanks, Gabe. I think for, uh, for myself, and I'll emphasize just what you said. So here in Detroit, obviously that I mentioned before, we were hit uh, rather um, hard by COVID-19. And I know we, uh, for the most part in our FQHC, have gone to just essential visits. So for us, that's mostly seeing prenatal care, uh, kids less than 15 months, and then any acute issues that come up for our patient population. And so uh, that has limited some of the face-to-face -face visits. We do have done a lot of uh, video visits and telephone uh, visits as well. Um, I would say that from the, the most part, especially coming from a motiv motivational interviewing standpoint, especially for those that are smoking, um, I actually think, you know, for the most part, my experience has been that you can um, still have this conversation, still emphasize um, that the, the importance of quitting smoking, even if it's in a different uh, method, is specifically on a video visit or on the telephone. Um, that's actually one of the benefits, I think, um, is still having that ability to connect with our patients, even though we may be in two different locations. And so I can say it has been different for us. Um, but I, I think we, you know, I think when you're talking to patients, there's definitely a lot of fear related to COVID-19. Uh, and I think when they understand for us, our goal is always to uh, allow them to be the healthiest that they can. Um, having that conversation is actually, I would say, been a more positive conversation. And people are, seem to be much more willing to discuss the idea of quitting smoking and some of the resources that we may have for them. Thanks, Dr. Price. The next question we have uh, is for Dr. Twentyman. Um, Want to highlight uh, patients who are uh, who are smoking e-cigarettes, um, and so continuing off of some of the uh, data that Dr. King shared, um, uh, even though the evidence on e-cigarettes is uh, not entirely uh, conclusive, but we have there are conditions that are associated with uh, smoking e-cigarettes, and there has been that increase uh, in usage of those products. Um, what concerns, could you go into more detail about what concerns there are about the dangers that the associated conditions have for those patients and how you would have that conversation with your patients about the risk for uh, COVID? Sure, thank you for the question. I think that 
As others have mentioned on this webinar, COVID may offer us an opportunity to interact with patients concerned about COVID, um, willing to reach out who may not otherwise be so willing. And so this is a great opportunity and we should use that together. I think it's important to note that e the jury is still out on whether e-cigarettes uh, can help people transition away from cigarettes and quit. I think it's also important to note for patients' own sake that um, it is not safer to be using e-cigarettes and cigarettes together. Uh, and in fact, if there is a benefit from, from them in an adult population, it would be from complete cessation of cigarettes entirely. So not moving into this situation where you're using both at the same time. I think too, this is an opportunity to underscore to uh, young people and other populations that we would never want to be using e-cigarettes, uh, such as uh, youth and pregnant women, um, that for some people, e-cigarette use is just never safe at all, uh, at all, in any circumstances. Um, and then for all people, for all patients, this might be a great opportunity to talk about how to use this um, scary situation that the pandemic presents to people to optimize our health. And, and the way we would do that best is to stop using tobacco. And so I think if you can use these conversations um, to apply the tools that we know work for tobacco cessation, this would be the best use of that opportunity. And you could in fact use coronavirus as, as an example of why it's so important to protect our heart, protect our lungs and stay away from tobacco. Um, some specific tools to that end, um, I know tools have been requested. So smokefree.gov, uh, on the far right side, you'll see help others quit. So probably you as a healthcare provider are, are not smoking yourself, but under help others quit, the very top line is information for healthcare professionals. So that's another really good source of information and strategies that you can use to help your patients optimize their health in this tough time. Thanks, Dr. Twentyman. And I think that point about um, optimizing health is a really uh, great point. And I, it, those resources are really, really important. And on the point of resources, um, uh, Dr. Bryce, could you briefly share a little bit about your experience? Um, you talked about uh, the resources that are available through the TIPS campaign and um, how you worked with us in the last year uh, on that effort to share those with your patients. Um, could you uh, talk a little bit um, uh, more, and uh, Dr. King as well, maybe, about why you might feel those resources are so uh, impactful and, um, and uh, meaningful to your patients? Yeah, thanks, Gabe. I think uh, from my perspective is that, you know, a lot of the patients that we um, took care of, and let me explain a little bit more about what resources we did have. Uh, so if you've seen the commercials, they kind of highlight different people that have had detrimental effects for, uh, related to uh, tobacco and cigarette smoking. And so uh, there's usually the commercial, and these are actually on the CDC's website as well, the TIPS website, um, that if you want to watch any of the videos, um, that they're available. <laughs> what we had, was, and then we had posters uh, that, that we received that actually showed the pictures of those that were in the commercials. Um, and then had the kind of the description of what happened to the patient um, on the poster as well. Um, usually kind of with a, uh, uh, one of their highlighted quotes, um, very large that you could see. So it kind of made sense what you were looking at. Um, the, the, the thing, the reason I found there to be a benefit is because of course, I think the, the television commercials are really, really important. But as we all know, you see a commercial, then possibly you're, you're kind of tuning out, you're going to get food or whatever during the commercial if you're watching a program or whatever. Here though, this was something that a lot of patients had actually seen on television. Um, so they were familiar with it, but now it's right in front of their face that no, and we're gonna be discussing it within the visit. And so it just kind of, from my perspective of besides the fact that I'm gonna be talking about quitting smoking, um, now I have like something else to kind of support uh, support me and it kind of allowed the conversation to go in a different direction at times. Um, what, I, what I thought may happen was some patients would push back, uh, but I didn't see that at all actually. And in fact, as I mentioned to you during the presentation, I had a lot of patients and family members actually requesting the posters that we had hanging up in our 
center um, that they could take home and use it as more motivation, whether it was for themselves to quit smoking or if it was for a family member to help them to quit smoking. So I found that to be a, a, a big benefit. On top of that, we also shared information that they could access online that both uh, Dr. King and Dr. 20 Minute have already uh, emphasized. And so I think um, that just gave me one more tool to use to really uh, to help patients quit. And I found it to be very, very effective. Thanks, Dr. Bryce. And shifting gears a little bit, uh, we received a, a question, and this uh, is for uh, Dr. Bryce and Dr. Twentyman. Uh, a question, how do you handle patients on ACE inhibitors? Um, uh, any experience on uh, differences in working with those patients? I can take that one, Dr. Bryce, if you would like. Um, that's, that's a great question, and one that has arisen as we've learned more and more about um, receptors and pathophysiology of this virus. Um, I think it's important to note that the American Heart Association, the Heart Failure Society of America, and the American College of Cardiology all recommend continuing ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker medications for patients already prescribed uh, those medications. And that includes whether those medications are prescribed for heart failure, for hypertension, or for ischemic heart disease. Um, I think that's a great question. And I wanted to point to another resource, if it's okay for me to use uh, this opportunity to do so. Um, there is a whole frequently asked section, sorry, frequently asked questions section on our website. So if you go to cdc.gov backslash COVID and about in the middle of the page, there's a um, healthcare professionals. And then you'll find a frequently asked questions section within that. And in fact, there are several questions specifically uh, for patients with hypertension and safe management of those patients during this pandemic. Dr. Bryce, anything to add? No, Dr. Schwinn, I think, uh, I think you were right on. I know the initial, there was some initial thought processes that possibly ACEs could be detrimental, but it just doesn't seem like that data is there to support that. And especially when you're talking about those that have hypertension or congestive heart failure, it, it seems that at this point, um, it is still very wise to continue using those medications. Thank you both. And uh, another question that we just received, which seems a little bit more uh, a, a, of a clarifying question, and this will be for you, Dr. King. Um, is it thought that smoking tobacco or uh, smoking pot or vaping increases ACE2 receptor expression in and of itself, thus leading to increased infection uh, or disease progression? Uh, they're seeking clarity on that point. Um, yeah, short answer is yes, but there's still a lot of um, uh, uncertainty um, in terms of whether up or down regulation occurs. The available science is suggesting up regulation as a result of smoking, but it's, it's not necessarily products of combustion. Um, right now, um, what folks are looking at is the nicotine. And so if there is a potential pathway associated with, with nicotine in terms of down regulation, which some people have proposed, um, that could have some implications for, for e-cigarettes. But at present, um, the available science um, is, is speaking um, to this longstanding body of evidence suggesting that, that ACE2 um, uh, leads um, to, to upregulation um, in terms of, of um, uh, infection of, of COVID-19 in the relationship with smoking. Thanks, Dr. King. And uh, another question is um, in regard to, are we uh, seeing any uh, concerns in regard to the use of uh, uh, pharmaceutical cessation products with patients? Um, and do you feel that those are uh, important at this current moment, or how do you have conversations about those resources? And I'll uh, uh, leave that to Dr. Bryce and Dr. Twentyman. Hey Gabe, say that one more time. I missed that one. It got cut off for one second. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, are you having conversations uh, with patients at the current moment regarding uh, pharmaceutical uh, cessation products that can, can assist them in the process of quitting? Yeah, so at this point for me, I think it's kind of the repertoire that I already have is trying to figure out where they're at, um, what things they may have used in the past, whether it is pharmaceuticals or other behavioral uh, type um, exercises that they've used to try to quit. Um, and so, yeah, I'm still kind of practicing the same way. Um, I just think the conversation is becoming much deeper, understanding the detrimental effects of COVID-19 and, and the most likely association that comes along with uh, 
cigarette smoking. And Dr. Twentleman, anything else that you want to add would be great. I'll just uh, jump in to agree with you there. Um, I think this pandemic has uh, posed some challenges to primary care, certainly, and uh, smoking cessation uh, is, a, is a bedrock of effective primary care. Um, I think that we know what works and we should continue to use those tools and strategies. Um, sometimes we have to adapt that for the context we're in. So just echoing what Dr. Bryce was saying earlier, um, you know, this counseling can happen uh, virtually as well as in person and, and we should take uh, those opportunities where they arise and continue to use the pharmacologic uh, agents we, we know and we have good data for uh, as we have. And this is Brian. I mean, one thing that I would like to add here is there's been a lot of dialogue around nicotine replacement therapy following the release of that French study that found a protective effect. Um, and you actually had an, an issue um, where the French government um, had to put limitations on NRT because there was non-smokers purchasing the products thinking that nicotine would somehow um, be protective of COVID-19. And so I think this is also a teachable moment and not only around discussing uh, the benefits of nicotine replacement therapy and, and you know, other FDA approved medications around cessation for, for smokers themselves, but also others, um, acknowledging that there's this long standing body of evidence demonstrating the effectiveness of using these products and when you use it with counseling, behavioral counseling, you can more than double the likelihood of quitting. Um, but there's not going to be a, a beneficial effect for these products among non-smokers. And that's something that particularly in the media, there's been a lot of dialogue and uncertainty. Um, and so I think if there's another, um, a, you know, kernel of wisdom out of this is that the, the NRT has now entered the dialogue of a broad array of people who otherwise would not have considered it. And so that's another discussion that, that the clinicians want to be mindful of, given um, some of the attention internationally, but also what we're seeing in the United States, um, uh, very similar to what we saw around the hydroxychloroquine discussions, um, where folks are, are looking at potential medications as uh, being maybe prophylactic um, or even for treatment. And, and now nicotine replacement therapy has entered that dialogue. Um, and it's important that we quell this perceptions and reinforce, um, you know, evidence-based treatments um, for, the, for the right people at the right time. Thanks, Dr. King. And we just received a, another question uh, regarding um, cessation counseling. Um, the participant asked, uh, saying that uh, they have been practicing for a long time and still don't feel that they are effective at coaching patients to quit smoking. Uh, what input do you have in terms of uh, starting those conversations and what resources could you point physicians to uh, regarding this? Well, I can speak to that as well. Um, I think it's a really important to understand, and this goes for any time, time, time or any time that you may be using motivational interviewing. As we know, smoke, quitting smoking is difficult. Um, I think where I struggled earlier on in my career was taking each time, you know, the amount of time that I would spend with the patient to convince them to quit. And then they would say they'd quit and then they'd come back and they wouldn't have quit. And that can be frustrating and almost, you can take it personal. And what I realized is it's like every time that you see a patient, I think we, this is where some of the data would support is this should be a conversation every time that you see them, not to be uh, putting anyone down. It's just to be positive and trying to really work with them to, to quit and show them that you really care about them. Because I think whether it's smoking cessation or any type of behavioral changes that you're trying to implement in your practice, um, is just being positive and really trying to, uh, you know, encourage them to make those steps to become healthier. Um, I think, you know, things like the TIPS program, I think have been, you know, some of these supplemental educational things um, that have been really helpful for uh, some of my patients as well. But once again, not for all of my patients, not every patient wants to talk about quitting smoking. And that's okay. We're going to try and we're going to try to see where they're at and do the best that we can. Um, I think it's it's hard, uh, but I think uh, the effort is, you know, that's all that really matters. Whether somebody quits or not, that's really important, but it's still important just to get put the effort into having that conversation. And I think now with uh, COVID-19, it's even that much more important to do that. Yeah, and please, Dr. Twentyman or Dr. King, if you have anything else to share, please do. I think that's a really important question. Um, I will chime in to agree with you again, Dr. Bryce, and um, and to really share your experience. It it can sometimes be disheartening to um, counsel patients multiple times to quit and have them um, frame on this is that 
every interaction with these patients is an opportunity uh, to offer counseling towards cessation. Uh, we, we know that even brief counseling increases likelihood of successful quit among tobacco users. And so we know, we can know that we're doing the right thing, even if it doesn't work on the first time, even if it doesn't work every or with our patients, um, we may indeed need to offer that, that help multiple times. In terms of some additional resources, uh, there are um, the resources I mentioned under smokefree.gov. And then there are additional resources under cdc.gov backslash tobacco um, under uh, quitting, it's one of the middle boxes, um, additional resources there. And uh, there is a series of short films called Treatment and Beyond uh, produced by the Global Tobacco Control Branch that are also available on YouTube towards cessation. Um, so those are just a few of the available resources and, and I would just encourage you to continue and, and thank you for being on the, on the front lines of protecting patients' health both now and in the future. And Dr. Twentyman, thank you for uh, sharing all of those resources. Um, and one thing uh, we would love to uh, hear a little bit more on is uh, what, like you highlighted uh, with primary care being the, the, the bedrock of, of, of care in terms of get, catching these patients initially and starting these conversations. Um, how, why do you feel it's also important for uh, other uh, clinicians and, and physicians and other specialties to also have these conversations? And um, uh, are there any different resources that might be available to uh, physicians practicing in different specialties? Oh. And it looks like you are still on uh, mute, Dr. Twentyman. Apologies, it was indeed. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, a lot of the resources that are excellent for primary care physicians are also excellent for specialists. You know, the, the pulmonologists among us are often seeing later stages of the consequence of tobacco use than, than some of us in primary care are. Um, but nevertheless, the start of those conversations um, can often be the same. The only thing I'd add uh, for those seeing these later stages is uh, they, those, those specialists may be able to um, offer their observations of, of, of opportunities to um, improve health and prevent further deterioration within a given condition um, based on what they're practicing and what they're seeing. Uh, so I think that the, the motivational interviewing um, principles are the same. I think uh, that the, the truth of the um, positive impact of physicians of all sorts offering even brief cessation counseling still holds. And um, I believe those resources therefore will still be, still be helpful. Thanks, Dr. Twentyman. And it looks like we are at uh, the end of the hour. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for taking the time to join us today and share your expertise on this issue. Um, this conversation has really been insightful and will be useful um, to those who are having conversations with their patients about uh, smoking on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and also dealing with uh, patients in the midst of, of the current pandemic. So thank you so much. And as a note to all of our uh, participants today, uh, remember to take the uh, post uh, webinar quiz for CME credit. Um, that will be on the, uh, re the registration page. Uh, on the page on AOA Online Learning, you'll also find uh, tips resources. Uh, so you can follow the links to those resources. And then also, if you're interested in working with the AOA and CDC on the tips, partnership. You can also uh, find a link there where you can uh, share your information uh, if you are interested. Uh, thank you again to everyone for joining us and um, that concludes our webinar. Thank you so much.